This video is kindly sponsored by Keeps. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. The concept of a soul is one of those things you probably instinctively understand, but you might have trouble explaining to someone who'd never heard of it before. If that's the case, don't worry. You aren't the only one. We humans have been trying to figure out exactly what our souls are for literally thousands of years. During that time, countless ideas have been put forward by various religions and uh, who's who of humanity's greatest thinkers. Whilst no single definition exists to this day, most people agree that the soul is a non-physical and possibly a mortal part of us that essentially makes each of us who we are. Considering it's something we can't see or measure in any way, it's kind of interesting that almost every culture in history has believed in a human soul of some shape or form. For whatever reason, we seem to be predisposed to accept there's more to us than just meat and bones. The question is, is there? Now, I want to take a moment to talk about hair loss, because I've had people close to me start to lose their hair as early as their 20s, and it's always been an upsetting experience. If you're in the same boat, then you're not alone. Did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative now and do something about it whilst you've still got hair left. I like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication every three months so you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. There's a reason that Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and hundreds of thousands of men trust them for their hair loss prevention medication. If you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose your hair just yet, but prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you'll see results. And the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash 42, or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. Don't miss out. Plenty of people have attempted to find out exactly that over the years. Take American physician Duncan McDougall, for example, who, in 1901, conducted what would go on to become arguably one of the most famous experiments in history, for all the wrong reasons. McDougall's idea was pretty simple. Hmm. He reasoned that if the soul existed, it must be a physical thing like every other part of our bodies. If that was the case, it must have a mass. And if the soul had mass, McDougall could weigh it. So far, so logical. But there is one slight problem with this groundbreaking idea. In order to successfully conduct the experiment, McDougall was going to have to get his hands on a nice, fresh soul to pop on his scale. It seemed he'd run up against a kind of scientific catch-22. In order to prove the soul existed, he'd first need a soul to weigh. But if he had a soul to weigh, he wouldn't need to prove they existed. The solution McDougall found to this apparent paradox was actually kind of ingenious, if a little ethically questionable. You see, he realised that weighing a soul was actually pretty easy. All you had to do was stick a human on a scale. The hard part would be figuring out how much of that person's total weight came from their soul and how much came from all the meaty bits they're made up of. So, any ideas how he did it? Well, McDougall was a Christian, and like any Christian worth his communion wafer, he knew that when we die, our souls leave our bodies and head off in search of the big party in the sky. All McDougall had to do was weigh someone in the process of dying. If their body suddenly got lighter at the moment of death, it must be caused by the soul leaving the body. Admittedly, the logistics of this apparently straightforward idea hmm. were a little tricky. In order to complete the experiment in a timely manner, McDougall was going to need a bunch of test subjects prepared to hop on his scale and immediately die. 
Luckily for McDougal, and unluckily for basically everyone else, tuberculosis was a huge killer in the US at the time, and as far as diseases went, TB was practically tailor-made for his soul experiment. Not only was it pretty obvious when sufferers were nearing the end, the disease also made them incredibly weak and feeble, meaning they were unlikely to mess up McDougal's delicate measurements in their death throes. The next problem came in convincing local terminally ill TB sufferers to spend their final moments lying on McDougal's industrial-sized scale rather than, you know, saying goodbye to their loved ones. But he must have been a pretty persuasive guy, because eventually he managed to sign up six people to do exactly that. Four were suffering from TB, one from diabetes, and one was just generally in a bit of a bad way. Considering their various states of ill health, it wasn't long before one of them began to show signs that death was approaching. McDougall didn't waste any time. Within a matter of minutes, the first test subject was in position on the scale. The man took a frankly inconsiderate 3.5 hours to actually die from that point, but McDougall didn't let impatience get to him. He watched a reading on the scale like a hawk, noting that the subject lost weight at a steady rate in the lead up to death, most likely through sweat. Dying from tuberculosis is hard work, but then, at the exact moment of death, something miraculous happened. The scale suddenly dipped, as though a small weight had been lifted from the test subject, well, the corpse. McDougall was certain he'd accounted for every variable, which could only mean one thing. His experiment had yes. been a success. He'd just weighed the human soul. You might be familiar with the results he got too. 21.3 grams. The figure remains famous to this day. It was the title of a 2003 film starring Sean Penn. It features in the lyrics of several songs and the plots of plenty of novels, including Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. It even cropped up in a recent episode of Ted Lasso. Unfortunately, this is probably a good time to point out that there were a few small problems with McDougall's legendary experiment. And when I say a few small problems, what I really mean is that calling it a scientific experiment should be seen as a personal insult to every scientist who's ever lived. You see, pretty much every aspect of the methodology McDougall employed was flawed. Oh. His sample size was small, his measuring equipment wasn't particularly sensitive, and he had no way of accurately pinpointing his subject's time of death, something that often isn't as obvious as you might expect. Even worse, during the experiments he carried out on his six subjects, McDougall only actually saw the famous 21 gram decrease in weight on one occasion. The other experiments were kind of a shambles. In one, McDougall's test subject had the audacity to die before the oh. scale was properly calibrated. And in another, an angry mob stormed into the lab and prevented the experiment from taking place altogether. In the other three experiments, McDougall got a different result every time. One of the subjects gained weight on death, and another lost a little before apparently putting it back on again. If you're wondering how exactly McDougall hmm. explained these inconsistent results, he didn't. He just ignored everything that didn't support his hypothesis. Now, in his defense, he did state that his results would need to be replicated in the future if they're to be widely accepted. And, as you can probably imagine, that's never happened. Today, the idea that the soul can be weighed has very much been left behind by mainstream science. In fact, for the most part, the scientific community has given up on the idea of a soul altogether. And the reason for that can be summed up in a single word. Neuroscience. In the past hundred years or so, and particularly in the last two or three decades, neuroscience has begun to uncover the secrets of the human brain at a truly remarkable rate. In that time, we found that many of the things we once considered to be firmly in the domain of the soul, things like falling in love and thinking deep thoughts about life, the universe, 
and everything, all seem to be explainable by physical processes taking place in the brain. And if everything about who we are can be explained by measurable, observable processes that take place in our brains and bodies, then it's hard to see where the soul fits in. Having said that, the game isn't quite up for the soul just yet. Because whilst neuroscience has taught us a huge amount about our brains, it turns out there's one thing it so far hasn't been able to explain. And if I'm being honest, it's kind of a biggie. Consciousness itself. You see, despite millennia of philosophical pondering and decades of rigorous scientific research, we humans are singularly unable to explain how or why we're self-aware. It's undoubtedly the biggest unanswered question in all of neuroscience, and our understanding of the subject is so poor, we don't even really have a good definition of what consciousness actually is in the first place. As frustrating as this might be, you have to appreciate the irony the human brain is currently completely unable to understand exactly how the human brain works. Then again, as scientist and author Lyle Watson once said, if the brain were so simple we could understand it, we would be so simple we couldn't. Well played, Lyle. Well played. So, whilst many a neuroscientist will happily tell you you don't have a soul, what they can't tell you is what it is you do have that makes you, well, you. An EEG or MRI scan can show us which parts of the brain are active whilst we make a cup of tea or smell a rose, but consciousness itself is different. We can't see it on a scan. And it doesn't reside in a single region of the brain. We know that because it often sticks around even when whole sections of the brain are damaged, or even removed entirely, Hannibal Lecter style. To say all that in its simplest terms, science can't explain why you, watching this video, are resident in your own mind. It's easy to assume that self-consciousness is just an inevitable byproduct of intelligence, but that doesn't seem to be the case. After all, computers can be far more intelligent than humans, at least in certain ways, and they aren't self-aware. Some scientists believe they never will be either, regardless of the advances we make with AI. Now, before any angry neuroscientists start complaining in the comments, I'm watching you, I should point out that the fact we can't explain consciousness isn't in itself an argument that souls exist. The truth is, as of today, there's no compelling scientific evidence supporting the idea that we humans come bundled with an inbuilt, non-physical, immortal soul. That might sound like a bit of a blow, but if it does turn out to be true, at least we should be used to it by now, science has an annoying habit of coming along and informing us humans that we aren't quite as special as we like to think we are. We used to believe the Earth was at the centre of the universe, until some bloke called Aristarchus of Samos ruined everything by pointing out that the Earth actually seemed to be orbiting the Sun. And Darwin rocked up more than 2,000 years later to bust the myth that we humans were somehow separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. It may well be that science slaying the soul is the next step on what has been a long and often uncomfortable journey for our species. But for many people, none of this matters in the slightest. Their belief in the existence of the soul is exactly that, a belief. It doesn't require evidence or proof, and therefore, science's opinion on the matter isn't really relevant, at least to them. As for which side of the debate you come down on, only you can decide. Thanks for watching. Good news, you can now pre-order my new book, Bread and Circuses, What Did the Romans Ever Do For Us? It's a wild and witty journey for a thousand years of unexpected Roman history, told in a refreshing way and packed full of incredible and unbelievable stories. Copies are selling out fast, so pre-order yours today to lock it in. Thank you.